Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much to ELI and, and Chris for having us. This is a really wonderful series every summer to take advantage of learning basics of the environmental laws that protect our planet, our air, and our water, and our land. I'm excited to be back here again this year, and uh, I'm joined by my colleague and friend, Abigail Jones of Riverkeeper. I'm Erin Flannery Keith. Um, Chris introduced me as a federal government water attorney. That means that I'm here on my own time. I work for the US EPA in the Office of Water, but I'm not here representing EPA I'm just or the US government. I'm here with my own thoughts and um, statements about the Clean Water Act that don't represent what the EPA thinks. Uh, Abby and I met at Pace Law School. We were partners in the environmental, environmental Litigation Clinic and took many of our environmental law courses together, and we learned the Clean Water Act together. And so it's exciting to be together now, uh, several years later, presenting on the basis of the basics of the Clean Water Act and, and what we've learned in our careers so far. After law school, I, I went to the EPA as an ORISE law fellow, the Oak Ridge uh, Institute of Science and Education. It's a fellowship program for recent graduates uh, before transitioning into a full-time attorney at EPA in the Office of Wastewater Management. And Abby uh, has her own story as well, and then we'll get started into our presentation. Great. Welcome. Um, I'm Abigail Jones. Uh, I go by Abby. I'm a staff attorney at Riverkeeper. I work in the Hudson River program there. Um, Riverkeeper is a member-supported organization um, dedicated to defending the Hudson River and the drinking watershed for New York City. Uh, before that, I was an attorney at a boutique environmental law firm in New York City where I did environmental due diligence for real estate transactions. And before that, right after graduating from law school at Pace, I went to Wyoming and worked for a law firm out there. We did mostly private property rights litigation and some natural resource litigation as well. So it's a pleasure to be here today. And getting started, um, we're here to present the Clean Water Act. We also like to start presentations with pictures of clean water <coughs> because our Clean Water Act professor and one of the <laughs> attorneys at the Environmental Legation Clinic at Pace always did so as well. So throughout you'll see some pictures of our favorite bodies of water. Um, this is Tumalo Creek, which is a tributary of the Deschutes River near Bend, Oregon. Um, and unfortunately, despite the fact that the Clean Water Act has been around for over 40 years now, there, over half of the U.S. waters remain impaired. Um, so what does that mean? What does impaired mean? Um, impaired means being polluted to the point that the water body cannot be used for the kinds of activities and uses that they should be able to be used for. So in some cases, that includes uh, recreation or fishing. Um, sometimes it includes drinking water as well. So over half of the waters in the U.S. cannot be used for those kind of um, uh, uses. Um, so what are, what are the polluting factors? The major sources of water pollution, as you can see in this slide, um, include industrial point sources, stormwater runoff, CAFOs, or consolidated animal feeding operations, um, and there are some exceptions to that rule. Uh, nutrients and spreading fertilizer onto at, uh, agricultural land, mining operation, non-point sources where it's just diffuse runoff going into the water bodies, and public-owned treatment for works or POTWs. So today in our presentation, we'll give you a brief history of the Clean Water Act, its uh, genesis and the regulations that have come forth from it. We'll talk about the substantive provisions of the act, some procedural features of the <coughs> act and the permits that it, it considers. And then we'll also consider some current issues in Clean Water Act practice and policy, as well as the fact pattern that ELI is using for all of its summer school uh, seminars this summer, uh, concentrating on the chemical spill that happened on the Elk River in West Virginia this earlier this year. Where do we find clean water law today? So the the regulation of the environment, law of the environment, uh, derived from common law, and there were the option to bring suits, perhaps a nuisance or trespass, if your water or land were being polluted upon. Today, of course, we find we have the Clean Water Act, which derives its authority through the Commerce Clause. Um, in law school, you learn about the many different ways that the Commerce Clause can affect different parts of our lives. But the reason, one of the, one of the reasons that the 
authority derives from the Commerce Clause. We'll talk a little bit about the Rivers and Harbors Act, which was the f one of the first laws to consider pollution in water and, and how it impacted uh, the movement of interstate commerce. There are also regulations uh, that are promulgated by the EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers and a few other federal agencies to uh, enact to bring the clean water, implement the Clean Water Act, uh, and these are promulgated according to congressional mandate. Case law in, in the Clean Water Act also builds upon itself, and states have some authority in the Clean Water Act. We'll talk about that a little bit later, and they may promulgate their own regulations. I mentioned the Rivers and Harbors Act just a little bit ago. Uh, the Rivers and Harbors Act of 1899 is the oldest federal environmental law, and though much of its purview is now under the Clean Water Act, it's still administered by the Army Corps of Engineers. The F Rivers and Harbors Act made it a misdemeanor to uh, discard refuse into navigable waters or their tributaries, uh, waters that were navig navigable in fact and that in affected interstate commerce. It also um, made it a misdemeanor to excavate or fill navigable waterways without a permit. It was aimed at hindrances to navigation, but also it was the first law that made it inherently wrong to pollute water. Except for the Rivers and Harbors Act, water pollution control developed largely as a creature of state law uh, rather than federal law until 1948, where the Federal Water Pollution Control Act uh, was passed and provided technical assistance and construction grants to states as partial funding to build municipal sewer systems. Um, that also provided the authority to bring public nuisance lawsuits to abate interstate water pollution when all other means failed. And then states also began to establish their own treatment regulations and enforcement mechanisms. The Clean Water Act, uh, the Clean Air Act, and NEPA, other Endangered Species Act, were all part of this generation of environmental laws that was born in the late 60s and early 1970s, where there was growing um, concern about the quality of the environment and what the federal government could do about it. Um, in this public concern with water pollution continued and started kind of in the 50s the, and then in the 60s when the Cuyahoga River in Ohio burned several mm -hmm. times. And that picture uh, on the top is from um, 1952, although there was another big fire in the late 1960s. And so this feeling about there must be some legal way to protect the, to protect the quality of water in the environment uh, began to also uh, foment in community groups as well. Um, and s something that Abby is very familiar with uh, in citizen protection of the Hudson River. In 1962, the Scenic Hudson Preservation Council sought to stop the Con Edison, which was the p electric utility, from building a hydroelectric dam on top of Storm King Mountain. And the bottom picture is on this slide um, is a, a rendering of what that might have looked like to supply uh, electricity to New York City. So the Scenic Hudson uh, submitted evidence that existing power plants were already destroying large numbers of fish and affecting water quality, including commercially st uh, valuable striped bass and part of interstate commerce. And there were also aesthetic concerns as well. And the Second Circuit held that Scenic Hudson had standing to sue based on harm to non-economic interests for aesthetic reasons, like I said. So this, but this was before there was a Clean Water Act to use a citizen suits for. So in this, this, gen this era of environmental laws that Congress was writing, um, the Clean Water Act was passed in 1972 and various amendments in 1977 and 1987 aimed to restore and maintain the chemical and physical and biological integrity of the nation's waters. And today it's administered by the US EPA, parts of it by the Army Corps of Engineers in partnership with other federal agencies and in partnership with states through a cooperative federalism approach. And I just want to add to what Erin was saying that um, she talked about the Storm King Mountain case and those kind of uh, issues are we're still fighting today. We're still fighting um, power plants, destruction of the fisheries in the Hudson River and throughout the United States. Um, and one of the, the biggest things that she mentioned that came through is that you can have standing, which is a legal term, you have to have standing to bring a lawsuit for non-economic interests. So that really opened the field to, as she said, aesthetic issues, environmental issues, um, and other issues like that. So that was, that's a very powerful case, the Storm King Mountain case. So what does the Clean Water Act not regulate? Um, there's an entirely other body of law concerned with water quantity. Um, you deal with this a lot more out west, um, although there is the Delaware Water 
River Basin Commission that deals with um, water quality quantity and who gets what in the states of um, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, and I, I think it includes Delaware as well. Um, water quantity is um, an appropriation rights issue. Um, out west there are different kinds, but most likely it's prior appropriation, first in time, first in right to the water. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, Delaware River Commission, there's also the Colorado Compact um, out west. And this picture shows the Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. It's the headwaters of the Colorado River in the Rocky Mountains um, National Park. And the Colorado River watershed spans seven states and eventually empties or should empty into the Gulf, Gulf of California. Um, given that it's first in time, first in right out west, a lot of um, the rivers and streams out there are over-appropriated, meaning that they've given too much of the waterway. And so in the case of the Colorado River, um, it really doesn't reach the Gulf of California. And in many cases, doesn't even get to some of the mo more southern states like uh, New Mexico. Um, and then whatever little water does left is highly saline and not really usable for things like agriculture or drinking water out there. Um, the Clean Water Act does not regulate groundwater. Um, that is really more like a state's uh, regulation. Um, and drinking water as well. They have the Safe Water Drinking Act, which is a federal act that regulates the quality of drinking water and regulates injection of pollutants into groundwater as well in some cases. Uh, the Clean Water Act does not regulate non-point source pollution. And we'll get into what counts as point and non-point sources. So the heart of the 1972 Clean Water Act is the goal. The goal is to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. And this is done by, among other things, um, more, most importantly, eliminating the discharge of pollutants uh, without permits, um, and we'll get into that as well, into the navigable waters of the United States. So the key here is um, the goal of the Clean Water Act is actually to restore those impaired waters that we began talking about. Um, it's not just to maintain what we have, it's to bring back the water bodies so that we can have fishable, swimmable, drinkable waters. And how is this goal implemented? Um, through the EPA and states, um, and some of these issues listed here we'll, we're going to cover in more detail. Um, the establishment of water quality standards for bodies of water. Um, listing of impaired and threatened waters, which ties back into the water quality standards. Establishment of monitoring and management programs. The development of TMDLs, total maximum daily loads into water bodies, which are designed to protect the water quality of those water bodies. It's a pretty technical issue, but we'll try to make it pretty short and sweet for your, for your understanding. Um, the EPA and states also issue permits to point sources which help to ensure the water quality standard achievements. That's what WQS means, water quality standards, as well as voluntary programs to manage the non-point sources. So point sources get permits. Non-point sources um, have voluntary programs and best management practices. Great. So now we're on the slide that talks about the three Ps. The Clean Water Act established a control strategy based on requiring dischargers to reduce the pollution in their effluents as much as possible using control technology. Before, the strategy had been based only on requiring dischargers to reduce pollution based on achieving desired levels of water quality. So here we have three Ps, prohibition, permits and penalties. The Clean Water Act established a sophisticated and streamlined regulatory and enforcement system with significant penalties for noncompliance. And it also empowered citizens to participate in the implementation and enforcement of the Clean Water Act. So the, we'll talk about the basic prohibition of the Clean Water Act, the two main kinds of permit uh, programs that the Clean Water Act envisions, penalties, and for our purposes for dis, uh, discussing the fact pattern, we have a bonus P today, and the P stands for plan for under Section 311 of the Clean Water Act. So the basic prohibition of the Clean Water Act is that except in compliance with this section, and it's in the Section 301 of the Clean Water Act, and several other sections that cover um, water quality-based effluent limitations, technology-based effluent limitations, limitations for toxics, specific limitations for aquaculture, 
or the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, Section 404 or 1342, uh, or the Dredge and Fill Permitting Program, Section 404 or 1344 of this title of the Clean Water Act. Um, so if you're discharging pollutants and you're not in compliance with those sections uh, and you don't have a permit, then your discharge is prohibited. So to break this down more, more specifically, we, um, we always look for the, what's the what are the elements of the prohibition or a Clean Water Act violation. We have a, the discharge of a pollutant by any person from a point source or of dredged or fill material into waters of the United States, except as in compliance with the listed permitting programs, 402 and 404. Um, every single word that's up here is heavily litigated and very incontroversial. So we'll talk a little bit, we'll talk you through the elements and also where some of the questions and controversies and litigation comes up. But the Clean Water Act is a living statute that people are very interested in because it affects their livelihoods and lives and quality of life. And so it's no surprise that there's constant litigation on the Clean Water Act. Um, what you won't see here that you might see in other statutes that you study in, study in law school or in your current practice is a mental state requirement. So is there a mental state required for a violation of the Clean Water Act? And the Clean Water Act, surprisingly, or not surprisingly, depending on who you are, is a strict liability statute. What that means is that you don't need to know that you are violating the law or that you are polluting uh, in order to be held violating the act. So no mental state is required. Um, this is different than a number of statutes, as Aaron mentioned. Um, and it's really, it's really something that goes to the ultimate goal of the Clean Wa Water Act to restore and maintain our water bodies. Um, so it's entirely possible that a, that a discharger or a polluter knows full well what he or she is doing and intentionally violates the act. Um, in that case, with a mens rea, mens rea means mental state, um, of negligently, knowingly, or recklessly, or purposely violating the statute. So in that case, and we're over in the criminal liability section now, you can imagine a company where um, the workers conspire to dispose of the company's waste illegally and know and intend that to be their behavior. And that's really where um, these environmental laws stemmed from in the 1970s. Um, people were just dumping pollutants on land, in the water, not really caring what happened. Um, I mean, the Hudson River, you could tell what color G GM was painting the cars that day because that's the color that the river was. It just um, wasn't something that people thought about back then. So that's why these, these statutes came about. Um, so knowledge, the, as I mentioned, knowledge of the specific statutes or regulations that would prohibit the wrongful action, in this case the discharge, um, is not required under the Clean Water Act. Uh, you don't need to know that the clean water is out there and you don't need to know the elements to be held liable for violating it. So it's not a defense to say, I didn't know that I was violating the Clean Water Act. Um, and then when a violator is aware of the wrongful conduct that's prohibited by law, the violation is said to be willful. And um, there's both, um, under the Clean Water Act, there's both uh, civil sanctions and administrative sanctions and criminal sanctions, and those have different levels of uh, mens rea or lack thereof under strict liability. You can also go to jail for violating the Clean Water Act as one of the criminal sanctions. Yes. And people have. And people have. <laughs> so we're going to walk through the elements of um, a Clean Water Act violation. As Aaron said, these, uh, these words are very heavily litigated, so don't take them at face value. Um, the first is discharge, and discharge is defined as any addition of any pollutant or combination of pollutants to waters of the United States from any point source. And in this picture here, you can see that there's muddy red water coming out of pipe. Um, and so most people say, clearly, that's a discharge. I'm seeing an addition into a water body. The next element is of a pollutant. Pollutants include dredged spoils, solid waste, incinerator residue, filter backwash, sewage, garbage, sewage sludge, 
munitions, which has been litigated, chemical waste, biological materials, radioactive materials, heat, wrecked or discarded equipment, rock, sand, cellar dirt, and industrial, municipal, and agricultural waste discharged into water. So as you can tell here, um, somebody might be discharging pollutants that you can't see. Um, it could be something like heat, which you can see here is a picture of the heat discharge from Indian Point on the Hudson River. Um, it can be something like rock, sand, and other just rubble, which you can see in this other picture, which is from um, the Gowanus Canal in Manhattan. So, and it includes larger solid things like trucks and cars, and so you just can't get rid of things in the, in the rivers and, and creeks anymore. Um, and then we'll talk about this a little bit more in detail, but dredge and fill material. So fill material being discharged with a backhoe um, and fill material has the effect of raising the bottom elevation of the water. The next element for a violation of the Clean Water Act is by a person. A person includes an individual, association, partnership, corporation, municipality, state or federal agency, or an agent or employee thereof. So looking at this, obviously a lot of lawsuits are brought against corporations, we know that. But those same lawsuits can also be brought against employees of that um, company, and that's Aaron mentioned under some of the criminal um, liability, you can go to jail, and that has happened for some of the um, employees or owners of um, corporations that have been found liable for violating the Clean Water Act. The next element for a violation of the Clean Water Act is from a point source. So we mentioned a little bit before about point source and non-point sources. A point source is any discernible, confined, and discrete conveyance, including but not limited to any pipe, ditch, channel, tunnel, conduit, concentrated animal feeding operation, um, which you wouldn't think that would be, but um, that's been litigated as well and been held to apply as a point source. Vessel or other floating craft, um, you can't dump from a ship, um, and that's kind of where the Harbors and uh, Rivers Act of 1899 uh, really started from. So um, what's excluded from a point source um, or agricultural stormwater discharges, irrigation return flows, and general non-point sources. So if, if you think a non-point source would, you have some land and the water, for example, from the, the rain or something is just flowing right into a, a river or creek. That would be an example of a non-point source. Um, one of the things we learned in law school in our Clean Water Act seminar, one of the first things, a person is not a point source. Um, there was somebody who was charged with violating the Clean Water Act, and Aaron, correct me if I'm wrong mm -hmm. here, but for dumping medical waste into a river. Correct. And they were held to be not a point source. Um, so that was an interesting little... Still not probably a good idea, though. <laughs> there are probably other, <laughs> other things you could be doing with your time. So here's just a picture of some point sources, as I mentioned, um, ships, and you can see the CAFO, as I mentioned, Consolidated Animal Feeding Operations. Um, you can see the discernible conduit here in the middle with the pipe, um, dredge and fill material, and then actually um, spraying from um, airplanes has been held to be a point source as well. Great. So the next element that we'll discuss is into a water of the United States. Uh, the Clean Water Act, EPA's Clean Water Act regulations, the Corps' Clean Water Act regulations uh, define what a water of the United States is. So. It includes the following things at face value. Water is currently used or susceptible to use in interstate commerce, including water subject to the ebb and flow of the tide. Uh, these are traditionally navigable waters. You can navigate in them in your boat, um, or they've been used in the past for navigation. Uh, these were the waters that the Rivers and Harbors Act was concerned with initially. But there are other waters that are not navigable, in fact, that uh, can also be a water of the United States. This also includes interstate waters, so picture a lake or a river that forms or is part of a border between two states. Other waters that could affect interstate or foreign commerce. Impoundments of waters of the United States, so if you build a dam within a water of the United States, that water doesn't stop being jurisdictional under the Clean Water Act just because it is now impounded. 
tributaries of the above four categories, waters that contribute flow, streams or waters that contribute flow into traditionally navigable waters or the other categories that I just discussed. The territorial sea, 12 miles from a state shore, and wetlands adjacent to the waters identified above. Abby mentioned before that we're talking about surface waters, not groundwater. Um, so the next slide here is a graphic to help you envision the um, what a water of the United States is. Right in the center, you'll see a water um, that looks like a, a, a stream. And that's a Section 10 Rivers and Harbors Act water. There's no question that it's traditionally navigable. In fact, navig navigable has a particular meaning under the Rivers and Harbors Act. It must be navigable, in fact. And there's actually a list of Section 10 waters that the Corps considers navigable, in fact, for purposes of regulating and permitting under Section 10. But lots of they're also subject to um, Clean Water Act regulation, um, these waters that have an ordinary high water mark, bed in a bank. Um, but it doesn't have, like I said before, it doesn't have to be traditionally navigable in order to be jurisdictional under the Clean Water Act. There are wet, we talked about wetlands that are adjacent, other waters that are, um, waters that are adjacent to traditionally navigable waters. Um, but then you also see at the sides, uplands, which are not jurisdictional under the Clean Water Act. So the regulatory definition of waters of the U.S. has been interpreted to cover several different kinds of surface waters, um, including what you would think of probably off the top of your head, rivers and streams, lakes, ponds, wetlands, sloughs, prairie potholes, uh, and intermittent streams, et cetera. Here is a picture of Hanging Lake in, uh, Glen near Glenwood Springs, Colorado, which then contributes flow to other uh, tributaries down into the Snake River and other, other traditionally navigable waters in Colorado. There's also a couple of regulatory exclusions from the definition of waters of the U.S. The first is uh, waste treatment systems. Waste treatment systems might be ponds or lagoons where waste treatment is occurring, um, maybe through settling, maybe through another process to get the pollutants out. And in this defined area, dischargers don't have to meet water quality standards or have a permit to discharge into them because they're not waters of the U.S. Um, but if you have a waste treatment system that itself discharges into a water of the U.S., then you need a permit for that, and that permit would um, would require the discharger to meet water quality standards there. Um, once the treatment has occurred, uh, you have to, and you're discharging into a water of the U.S., you have to now comply with the Clean Water Act. Um, and also, prior converted cropland is not a not a water of the U.S. These were wetlands that were dredged or filled, uh, somehow other, otherwise manipulated before 1985. This is a provision of uh, Swamp and Buster in the f 1980 farm, 1985 Farm Bill. So crystal clear, right? So the, like we said before, all these terms heavily thought about in Clean Water Act circles. Um, so two major Supreme Court cases have made the interpretation of the, de of the definition of water as the United States and the implementation of the Clean Water Act um, less clear in the last uh, decade or more. Uh, the first case was uh, Swank versus the United States Army Corps of Engineers in 2001. And here the Supreme Court found that there was not Clean Water Act jurisdiction over isolated interstate intrastate waters. Um, these were little ponds that had developed at a um, weight at a, at a solid waste dump um, that birds were using. And so they're saying, well, th no, these isolated waters cannot be jurisdictional just for the fact that they're used by migratory birds in, in, in habitat. Uh, there needs to be something more to connect these geographically isolated waters to Clean Water Act jurisdiction. And if I could just interrupt for a mm -hmm. second. Um, the reason that, you know, migratory bird habit comes up under the Clean Water Act is because if you remember Aaron talked about this jurisdiction for the Clean Water Act really comes from the Commerce Clause which regulates interstate commerce so migratory birds hunting interstate commerce just so that's a little bit clear of why are we talking about migratory bird habitats under the Clean Water Act thanks Abby yeah and actually that provision came from a sentence and a preamble of a of a definition of waters the US um, and the Supreme Court then interpreted it to mean that you needed more than just the presence of migratory birds. 
Um, so a few years later, there was another Supreme Court case or, complicate, or a set of consolidated <laughs> cases that produced a particularly complicated set of opinions. There were five opinions in Rapanos, none of them having the majority of justices. And so two main opinions followed. Um, th either there must be a significant nexus between wetlands and the waters that they uh, feed for there to be Clean Water Act jurisdiction over wetlands, or um, Justice Scalia, the plurality opinion, said that they're relatively permanent waters or seasonal waters or wetlands with a continuous surface connection to those waters would be jurisdictional. Um, and Justice Kennedy's significant nexus test contemplated for, for wetlands and waters would be jurisdictional if they affect the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of traditionally navigable waters. That language comes somewhat, not the significant nexus part, but the, the second part, um, from the goal of the Clean right. Water Act that we talked about at the outset. Um, so this decision, these sets of decisions came out in 2006. Um, as EPA, Corps, and state field staff tried to implement them, it became um, necessary for the EPA and the Corps to write a guidance, a joint guidance in 2008, on making these jurisdictional determinations, including elements for finding that significant nexus, chemical, physical, biological connection to traditionally navigable waters. Um, the confusion remained. And in March of this year, uh, EPA and the Corps put out for public comment a proposed rule that would attempt to clarify this confusion, um, not to expand jurisdiction, but um, help deal with the ambiguity about how water should be considered to be jurisdictional. Um, maintains those existing exemptions we talked about before for agricultural stormwater, return flows from irrigation, the waste treatment system, prior converted cropland. Um, and because it has to hew to the new interpretation, from the interpretation of the Supreme Court in Rapanos, um, which protects fewer waters than the historical scope of the jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act, um, that's what the agencies wrote. And um, when the Clean Water Act was, was written the, in the congressional record, we find evidence that the authors of the act wanted the, wanted the Clean Water Act to expand as far as the Commerce Clause would allow. So that was interpreted to be a very broad jurisdiction at that time. Swank and Rapanos have narrowed that, and the agencies are attempting to clarify that. Um, there are also uh, cases where states, 36 states in fact, have some sort of legal uh, restriction on what kinds of waters they can regulate and protect outside of the waters that have to be protected under the Clean Water Act. Um, so there's um, a need to, to clarify Clean Water Act jurisdiction. And you thought this would be simple. <laughs> so at this time, we wanted to pause for a second and see if there are any questions from the, fir the first chunk of our presentation. And while you're doing that, if you have the fact pattern, you want to quickly look at it as well, because um, we are going to be applying that question. So, so the, we're talking about the definition of a pollutant. In there was garbage. Makes me think, what about people's garbage disposals? Uh, isn't that, I mean, if I take last night's dinner and stuff it mm -hmm. down the garbage disposal, it's going to go through the pipes and eventually lead to a waterway. Uh, so. I assume that's not a Clean Water Act violation. Why is that? Okay. So the question was, um, the definition of pollutant in charge includes um, refuse, but you know we put refuse in our garbage disposals all the time, and how is that not a violation of the Clean Water Act? Um, the answer is because um, we're connected to um, sewer systems. So all of our sewer wastes, our toilets, our sinks, our washers and dryers, all goes to a publicly owned treatment facility or some kind of municipal treatment facility. They then have, um, you know, they have their regulations that determine what they need, how they need to clean the water, to what level, and then they are permitted um, through the NIPTES National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System or the state version SPEEDES State Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, and they have all of the. Um, We'll get into this a little bit later, but they have all of the regulations on what comes out of their pipe. So that's why we can put refuse in the water, but not violate the Clean Water Act. And then if you are not connected to a sewer system, right. um, if you're perhaps in a more rural area and you have a septic tank, then it just goes to your septic tank. And um, 
septic fields are designed to leach out liquids and um, in a way that doesn't um, harm water quality in your septic Correct. tank. Also, um, most septic tanks do not have direct discharges to waters of the U.S. In a few states, some do, in which case uh, EPA or the state will write a, a general permit for discharges from those kinds of systems into waters of the U.S. So there is, as Abby talked about, there is a, a, tr a train of treatment that goes from you putting um, some scraps of food down your garbage disposal and the way that it's treated once it reaches your uh, publicly owned treatment works and the publicly owned treatment works is responsible for meeting the terms of their NPDES permit. So, okay, we have a question in the back. So the question has to do with how do you dis um, decide whether a pollutant is a point source or coming from a point source or not a point source if there is, um, if, agri if agri agricultural stormwater is not um, a point source discharge into waters of the U.S., what about spraying of pesticides? Mm -hmm. So um, the spraying of the direct application of pesticides to waters of the U.S. is regulated, um, and it's a very specific way of thinking about how, where exactly the pollutants are going. Um, EPA wrote a pesticides general permit, an NPDES general permit, a few years ago. Um, states have, st states who are authorized to run the NPDES program have adopted that. And um, if you take a look at that, it has uh, specific language about the, the coverage of that permit. So if you know that you are spraying say mosquito um, insecticides onto uh, a water on your land and you know the water you know you have a water of the US on your land then you are covered by that permit that's that permit thinks about the kinds of discharges that you are you and your um, peer dischargers right. engage in similar activities are likely to do and um, so you're covered by that permit so I think the distinction there is the, the permit regulates what's coming directly out of the plane, not what's going on the field and then um, running off or leaching into the stream. And one thing that we've thrown around um, is general permits. That's versus an individual permit. So a general permit is offered for minor, um, minor discharges or minor activities that really don't have a significant impact. Or, or activities that are so similar and common that it's going to be the same kind of discharge across the board or very similar. Mm -hmm. um, and so then the, the permitting authority can, whether it's EPA or a state, can foresee those kinds of discharges that are likely to happen. Um, and instead of writing thousands of individual permits that look exactly the same, it's quite, it's administratively easier for an, a discharger to apply for coverage under a general permit. Um, notify the permitting authority that they're going, that they're seeking coverage um, under a notice of intent to be covered by that permit. Um, and then they meet the requirements and the effluent limitations in that permit, but therefore everybody, they're not just for you. Right. Um, so they're, they're all kinds of dischargers, not necessarily right. major or mi Correct. major or minor, um, it's both. And, um, and then individual permits, if you are, uh, have a, something is a little bit different about your industrial operation, um, then your permitting authority will write you, you can apply for, and the permitting authority will write you an individual permit and calculate effluent limitations specific to your industry, specific to your kind of operation. Maybe there's a history of violations, so there might be a compliance schedule within that permit. Um, but we'll talk about that a little more in, uh, a little bit further in the presentation. Okay, and I think we had one more question. Yeah, so the question is, if you introduce a invasive species or a, um, 
wildlife into a waterway that's not supposed to be there, can that be a violation of the Clean Water Act? And the answer is yes, it can be. And in particular, that is a concern with vessels and the interchange of ballast water as ships go from port to port and go from different kinds of water that might have a, uh, a kind of maybe a shellfish or a crustacean, um, an Asian carp right. um, that you might carry from, say, a, one water body into the Great Lakes. Um, there are, <coughs> we just talked about general permits. So a few years ago, EPA put out a vessel's general permit, which thinks about the kinds of species that can be discharged through ballast water. Yeah. Okay, so turning to the fact pattern, um, the Elk River chemical spill. And um, this is a real case, real um, issue that occurred, although um, ELI did include minor fictional elements to, um, for increased academic value. So we can actually hit all the elements of not only the Clean Water Act, but this has been used for the Clean Air Act, the NIP, uh, NEPA, all of the summer school series. So just so far, let's uh, recap our elements of what you need to have a Clean Water Act violation. So it's a discharge of a pollutant by any person from a point source or uh, of dredge and fill material into waters of the United States. Um, I don't know if anybody's really had a chance to immerse themselves in the fact pattern, but I'm going to open it up and see if anybody can identify whether or not we have a pollutant in this fact pattern. And if nobody can, we'll go through it. So, yes. We do. Um, here it talks about, I'm not going to pronounce that, but MCHM. And it says that it's a chemical foaming agent. It's an organic compound identified or classified as an alcohol. And it causes ill health effects. So um, we do have a pollutant. We also have polyglycol ether, ether, ethers, sorry, which are uh, solvents. And most are non-toxic. So we do have two pollutants in this fact pattern, um, and it does raise the point that um, pollutants don't need to be toxic. Um, it points out here that these eth ethers are non-toxic, but that does not matter. I mean, we're talking about species and, and refuse, so t toxicity is not um, a requirement to be a pollutant. Um, by a person. Um, we have a person here. It's the Freedom Industries. Um, as we talked about, it can be a corporation. Um, so that is covered. So, so far, we have two of the elements. Um, a discharge. Do we have a discharge? We do, yep. And a discharge, if you remember, is any addition. So that's really the key. Are you adding something to a water body that, that wasn't there? Um, and here we have in this Elk River chemical spill, we have spilled chemicals that um, entered the Elk River. So that's our addition. Um, waters of the United States, as Aaron pointed out, um, there are certain classified um, Section 10 mm -hmm. um, rivers that are identified, but this clearly Elk, Elk River is um, a waters of the United States. Um, point source. Do we have a point source here? That's a little bit um, on the fence. Yeah, and also remember that this is a, although this is a real thing that happened, our fact pattern is for teaching purposes, <laughs> and there are other people considering what sorts of liabilities are at stake here. So we're just thinking about it in terms of, you know, using a, a lot, kind of like a law school hypo, if Correct. you will. Um, so then we can, you know, play around with different ideas in yeah. terms of whether or not there's a point source. We have, we know we have some chemical drums. Mm -hmm. They were sitting on a bank. Right. They were leaking, mm -hmm. but there wasn't a, there wasn't a pipe where this was normally happening from. Right. A discrete conveyance. Discrete conveyance. Concernable so. conveyance. And, and in, in the fact pattern, it says um, in the third paragraph, the spilled chemicals seeped into the ground and contaminated the groundwater and nearby Elk River. So this kind of raises the question, if you contaminate the groundwater and then the groundwater contaminates the waters of the United States River, is that a point source? 
There is some some case law that says that if a pollutant reaches a water of the United States, then it could be a point source. But this is one of those things that if you were if you saw this on a law school exam, <laughs> you could, you know, use your facts and argue it really passionately either either way. So mm -hmm. remains to be seen what what the answer is here. Um, does anybody have anything they want to talk about with the fact pattern as it relates to the elements of a water quality violation? Any questions? Yes, question. Uh, in the second paragraph, it says there was a hole in one of the freedom storage tanks. Could that be construed as a point source? And since it's a, that's definitely, you could point to it and say it's coming out of there. Yeah, so the question was, um, in the second paragraph, it talks about how one of the storage tanks has a hole. And if the pollutants come out of the hole and into the waters of the United States, is that a violation? And yes, it would be. Um, what we don't know here necessarily is whether it was discharging directly into the waters of the United States or if there was some kind of um, path that it had to travel. Um, it does talk about um, lower down, um, let me just find it here. It talks about, I think, um, the chemicals were flowing across the floor, and this is a different, um, so leaking storage tank. Chemicals were flowing across the floor of the containment dike in a stream several feet wide and seeping into the ground. So if that stream several feet wide was, instead of seeping into the ground, going into the waters of the United States, is that a point source? That's what you would use as your argument. If you are the, the person bringing this, trying to bring a Clean Water Act. Right, so lawsuit. I think this fact pattern does a really good job of, of showing, I mean, we mentioned this plenty of times now that Although these elements of a Clean Water Act violation seem so simple, of course there's a discharge. It's in real life really sometimes not that simple, and it and you can argue it either way, um, and that's where we get you know almost 40 years after the Clean Water Act was established, these Waters of the United States decisions, which which kind of <laughs> forgive the pun muddy the water. So, um, any other questions before we move on? So we're going to continue on with the elements. Um, the last element um, that we're going to talk about is without or in violation of a permit. So a permit under the Clean Water Act is, is an authorization, it's a license. Um, it can be called a license to pollute. <laughs> um, it's granting permission to do something that would otherwise be illegal in absence of the permit. Um, it's issued by either the EPA or the state agency that has been delegated that responsibility. As um, Aaron mentioned, the Clean Water Act deals with cooperative federalism. Um, so I think, and I think we'll get to the slide, but I think all but four states in the United States have the delegated Clean Water Act um, authority. Um, and because it's a license, it is revocable. Um, so once you know you're dealing with waters of the United States, then you'll need a permit um, to discharge into the water. And there are two main Clean Water Act permits that we're going to be focusing on here. You've heard us talk about both of them. Section 402 of the Clean Water Act establishes the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permitting system, known as NIPIDES. Um, states are State Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permits, SPEEDES permits, just to get you involved with the lingo. Um, and it's issued by EPA or the authorized state government, which could be, in some cases, your Department of Natural Resources, your Department of Environmental Conservation, are the ones who draft the permits under Section 402. Section 404 of the Clean Water Act is the dredge and fill permits, um, and this is issued by the Army Corps of Engineers or authorized state government. And this is somewhat different because whereas the Speedies and Nipides permits, um, most states have taken that delegated authority. For the judge and fill permits, only two states have been authorized um, to do so. New Jersey and Michigan. So, so Section 404 permits are, uh, like Abby just mentioned, uh, generally written by the Army Corps of Engineers in their, their districts around the country. And the Army Corps of Engineers makes jurisdictional determinations according to that EPA Corps joint guidance that I talked about earlier in determining whether or not their, the threshold question of a water, the, whether you have a water in the United States, do you need a permit at all? Once the applicant for a 404 project knows that, that he or she or their company is going to need to fill a jurisdictional water of the U.S., then they apply for a permit. 
Um, there are a couple of different kinds of 404 permits. There are nationwide permits. These are general permits for actions, uh, usually by uh, landowners, that are pretty similar in nature. Um, they're going to have the same kind of effect on wetlands or waters in the U.S. Um, and then 404 individual permits are issued for more significant actions. There will be a more um, significant filling of waters in the U.S. and uh, also the associated secondary cumulative impacts of filling a water of the U.S. EPA has the authority to review and object to 404 permits and specifications for making it for a 404 permit area um, that are issued by the Corps if the administrator believes that the permit will have an unacceptable adverse effect on water supplies, fisheries, or other wild, uh, wildlife and recreational areas. That authority has been used only very rarely, only 13 times since the Clean Water Act was instituted in 1972. 404 permits don't include effluent limitation guidelines like 40, 404 permits don't include effluent limitation guidelines like 402 permits do, but the um, EPA and the Corps go through a Section 404B1 guidelines analysis that's outlined in the, in the Corps' regs. Um, and this alternatives analysis seeks to um, avoid, minimize, and compensate for the impacts of a dredge and fill operation. Um, does, this, does this dredge and fill, pro does this project have to involve a water in the United States? Can you build it in an uplands? Can you avoid the Clean Water Act altogether? No, okay, we're going to then minimize the impacts to waters in the United States. Can the project be a little bit smaller? Can it be in a slightly different area of waters in the United States? Um, once all those are considered, you then need to mitigate or compensate for your impacts. So if you're going to, say, fill an acre of wetlands, the Corps might say, well, then we're going to give you a mitigation requirement or ratio that you need to um, construct or uh, improve at one acre area of wetlands in some other similarly ecologically similar area. It's a very interesting area of the law mm -hmm. and also a really interesting area to look at how the different agencies work together. The 402 permits, which as we've mentioned a couple times in this presentation, are known as the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, or NIPTES. Permits are administered either by EPA or states. So states uh, the Clean Water Act contemplates that states are really going to take the lead on this, that states know their waters the best, they know the needs of uh, protecting the waters and also are most are best equipped to deal uh, in most cases with the kinds of dischargers in their states. So the Clean Water Act and its regulations consider that states will provide evidence that their state laws are at least as stringent as federal laws. Uh, they have adequate resources to administer a robust and active Clean Water Act Section 402 program, that they will hold dischargers accountable, um, that they have uh, enforcement mechanisms in place, and that also that the state laws have provide for adequate opportunities for the public to comment and participate in the development of Clean Water Act uh, 402 permits. And the EPA re retains um, an oversight role and offers implementation help to states. EPA also reviews draft permits and uh, can uh, object to draft permits. And we also wanted to note here that the federal enforcement is not barred by state enforcement action. If the administrator finds someone in violation of a permit issued by EPA or an authorized state, they can offer a compliance order and bring civil action, although states are, are usually on the ball on that as well. Um, so we talked about how a pro state has to show that they're able to, uh, to have this authorized program. Uh, the program authorization, uh, there's part in the Clean Water Act and its regulations that say that the program can be withdrawn for cause. Sometimes citizens submit petitions to, with, to EPA to withdraw a state's uh, Clean Water Act authority. Uh, perhaps they allege that the state no longer has the legal authority to administer a strong Clean Water Act program. Perhaps the state is not issuing permits that are protective of water quality. Um, and so usually EPA and the states work in concert to figure out how to solve these problems. Although EPA has this ability to pull back a, clean, a state's Clean Water Act prog uh, program, it's never been used uh, to pull back a state's program. And f as Abby mentioned, 46 states and uh, one territory, the Virgin Islands, are authorized to administer the NPDES program. EPA issues uh, Clean Water Act permits in Idaho, New Mexico, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. 
and Abby's going to talk about stormwater permits. And so, um, and this is kind of related to the fact pattern, so I'm just going to flag that for you. But um, one of the uh, Nibidis permits that is coming more and more to light are industrial stormwater permits. Um, and this stems from EPA's 1990 stormwater Nibidis permit regulations, which cover stormwater discharges associated with industrial activity. Those industrial activities covered include um, operators of MS4. MS4 stands for Municipal Separate Storm Sewer Systems, um, mouthful, so that's why we call it MS4, um, located in urbanized areas or um, cities and towns uh, with more than 100,000 uh, residents. Um, it covers industrial facilities in any one of the 11 categories that discharge to an MS4 or waters of the United States. These um, categories include things like you would expect um, for industrial activities, landfills, heavy manufacturing, um, certain mining operations, power plants, industrial activity. Um, operators of construction activity that disturb one or more acres of land are also covered um, under the industrial stormwater permits. Oil and gas industry construction activities that disturb more than five acres of land are required to apply for the permit coverage as well. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything. So um, municipal separate storm sewer systems are systems that are owned by municipalities and are designed to discharge stormwater um, into waters of the United States or waters. Um, and so many of the times, um, the stormwater is untreated. Um, so what's ever on, for example, parking lots, roofs, um, will just go into the storm sewer system and be discharged. Um, and therefore, because you're um, adding a pollutant to the waters of the United States through a discernible source, um, you need a nibbities permit. Um, and so not only a permit, but they also talk about implementing um, SWIPs or stormwater pollution prevention plans and or stormwater management programs using best management practices. Um, so you have that in addition to the Nibidis permit. They want you to be permitted, but they also want you to try to limit um, that stormwater discharge as much as possible. Some of these um, BMPs that I mentioned include um, public education, public involvement, detection and elimination, construction best management practices, post-construction best management practices, um, and prevention and good housekeeping. So we have, as we've talked about, general versus individual permits, and the general permit is a multi-sector general permit, MSGP. Um, and as Aaron mentioned, uh, general permits offer a more streamlined way for permittees to get coverage, especially if we're talking about thousands of municipalities across across the nation all basically doing the same thing. Um, individual permits might be needed for um, some kind of industrial activity or construction site that's doing something a little bit differently. Um, and so Aaron mentioned that they can file a notice of intent to be covered by a general permit in those cases. Um, there are two, there were two phases of the industrial stormwater permits. Phase one um, included large and medium cities and counties. Phase two, small urbanized MS4s and MS4s in unurbanized areas that had those stormwater systems designed by the agency that's permitting them. Um, and so generally phase one, the, they had individual permits um, because we're talking about large cities. They're not all the same. New York's different from San Francisco in terms of what they might be doing. Um, the phase two, small urbanized MS4s, they um, more likely are uh, under a general permit. And then there's a conditional no exposure exclusion, which um, Somebody who might think they need an industrial stormwater permit can obtain a certification if their industrial materials and operation are not exposed to stormwater. So here we're talking about something that's uh, in a facility located in a larger office building. You're manufacturing, but you're not actually exposed to stormwater. Or um, the only exposure to precipitation occurs from rooftops 
or in your parking lot, your actual manufacturing activities aren't exposed to stormwater. So that's what we're talking about when you talk about the no exposure exclusion. And um, if 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 a operator asks for that, they must check in every five years um, with the permitting authority. So at the beginning of the presentation, we talked about three Ps. We've covered two of them so far, and we'll talk about the usual one that we, we talk about with penalties in a second. We've talked about prohibition and permits. Um, for the purposes of talking about the fact pattern, we wanted to cover plans uh, in particular, Section 311 SPCC plans, Spill Prevention, Control, and Countermeasure. Section 311 of the Clean Water Act uh, prohibits the discharge of, of oil into waters of the U.S. or their adjoining shorelines. And so facilities that store oil in significant amounts have to prepare plans, uh, SPCC plans that are described in EPA's regulations um, that implement Section 311J. So in that section, they describe what's an oil, includes crude oil, petroleum, petroleum refined products, and some non-petroleum oils such as vegetable and animal oils and synthetic and mineral oils. Um, so if you are storing oil or a chemical that falls into that category, you might have to have a plan and have adequate containment in case the thing in which you're storing your chemical that could be oil leaks. <laughs> um, so you might have to have containment such as berms and dikes around, uh, uh, around above ground fuel tanks. You might use double wall berms to make sure that you protect the soil and the water that are around the area where you're storing. Um, and then there's also an, you know, an additional level of secondary containment that could be required where your areas are, uh, where you're unloading and loading your, your oils. So in these SPCC plans, um, these are operating procedures to prevent oil spills, control measures to prevent spills from reaching the environment, reaching waters of the U.S., and then countermeasures in case a spill actually happens so that you know to contain. You, you're telling your, your state that, yes, we have a plan to contain, clean up, and mitigate the effects of oil, oil spills in case our um, containers of oil leak. And the owner and operator of the facility has to review their plan every fi at least every five years, keep records of those reviews that should be available to the state environmental agency if they come to do an inspection. Um, and there are also penalties, just like there are Clean Water Act penalties for violations of Section 402 and 404 permits or discharges without a permit. Um, and these are hefty. So you can be penalized up to $37,500 per day per violation. Um, and there are unannounced random inspections that can happen. Um, and there are other civil and administrative penalties if you spill into a water of the US, um, if you fail to notify your authority, your authority, a federal authority or state authority of a spill, it could also lead to criminal liability. Um, and the owner and operator is the one that's responsible for notifying uh, the federal and state authorities if there's a spill. So let's get back to our fact pattern for a second. Um, our fact pattern asks, um, well, here we'll ask whether or not this was a dis the discharge of the Elk River was a discharge uh, without or in violation of a permit. Our fact pattern says that the only permit that this facility had was a stormwater general permit that Abby talked about. Um, thinking about the, the usual kinds of discharges that come from an industrial facility, uh, even if you're not producing wastewater, the stuff on your, your land where mm -hmm. you, either you have storage tanks or other industrial equipment and operations, um, if it rains, those chemicals and pollutants could wash into the water, so you have to be covered under this general permit, and it's administrative convenience to have a general permit. So it covers the kinds of pollutants that your per permitting authority could reasonably expect to be in your runoff, basically, right. but it's a point source discharge um, designated, so de designated as such uh, under the Clean Water Act by EPA and the permitting authorities. Um, so it sounds like they didn't have any other kind of permit. It right. um, sounds like they didn't have a 402 individual permit. Um, there wasn't any dredge or filling happening. Correct. Um, that happens when you raise the bottom elevation of a water. So um, clearly they were, if, if, you, if we're talking about 402, 
they didn't have a permit, so without a permit, it would be if ever, if all the other elements are there, it would be a violation. Mm -hmm. um, the industrial stormwater permit, as Aaron mentioned, covers your normal normal runoff, you know, whatever oils or whatever in your parking lot, but um, question whether or not this kind of excessive contamination of um, MCHM and polyglycol ethers is probably not permitted um, within that NIPTES permit for general stormwater discharge. Yeah. So there'd probably be arguments back and forth right. as to whether or not a permitting authority should have known that kind of thing could happen. Um, or if they should have had another, an individual stormwater permit that could have more carefully covered something like that. Again, things that the lawyers for either side would argue back and forth. Um, our fact pattern also says that they didn't have a any sort of containment plan to to deal with this mm -hmm. kind of thing. So that's probably something that a regulator would look into mm -hmm. and, and determine whether or not this um, whether civil or criminal penalties would attach for not having a plan to contain a spill and then clean up a spill really quickly after it happened. I think there is something in the in the fact pattern that talks about when they found out. Correct. Is that right? Um, uh, it, it says that DEP arrived to investigate and they discovered it, but that workers had noticed this bill, but no one had reported it to the DEP or any federal regulatory authorities. So now we're getting back into Clean Water Act as a strict liability. You don't need to know, but if you do know, you could be opening yourself up to criminal sanctions and liabilities. And I think that's what mm -hmm. you know Aaron was getting out with the um, SPCC plans. Um, and so I just wanted to know if anybody had any questions um, up to this point. Yes. My question is about under the countermeasures. Is there an expectation of what would be considered reasonable? And in the second paragraph, they said 10,000 gallons of a 48,000 gallon, you know, right. container was leaking. If they did have a plan for up to 12,000 gallons or something, is there an expectation of reasonableness or, I mean, and I use that word loosely, just because I think it's easier to convey what I mean, <coughs> um, or would they have had to have a plan to accommodate loss of everything? Okay. Okay. So the question um, was about the countermeasures that could reasonably be expected to be in place for a spill like this if 10,000 gallons of a 48,000 gallon uh, container spilled, what would would the facility have been expected to, to react to that? Uh, I don't know, and I would be happy to research that answer for you if we want to talk afterwards. Um, I don't want to give you incorrect information. Um, yes. The question was, are Nippity's per permits only for point sources? Yes. And leaking anything doesn't have a general, isn't considered generally either point or non-point or non-point or non-point. Yeah, so th the question is about continuous discharges um, and whether leaking, leaking shouldn't happen. Um, if you are in, when you have an NPDES permit, you will have various conditions that you have to adhere to. Um, effluent limitations, which I'll talk about in a second, as well as other special and standard conditions that should be in your permit. So one of the standard conditions is that you're not going to have, you're going to monitor your facility and your op equipment that does your operation so that nothing out of the ordinary happens. Um, so a, a limits written in an NPDES permit aren't going to, um, contemplate accidental spills. You need to absolutely I, I let your permitting authority know if that sort of thing happens. Um, but the idea is that you're going to maintain your facility to the uh, standards where that a leaking drum isn't going to happen, and a leaking pipe uh, that's leaking sewage into your treatment system, that's that not going to happen. If that sort of um, operational and maintenance failure occurs, um, you could be in violation of your NPDES permit. And one of the things that I like to point out is we are just focusing on the Clean Water Act here. So this fact pattern talks about spills. That's that's more along the lines of RICRA and CERCRA, which deal with um, the storage, transport, disposal of hazardous waste, that's RICRA, and, also, and hazardous materials, and also CERCLA, which um, post-spill how do you clean up a contaminated site? Circle is known as Superfund. 
as well. So. But but SPCC is part of the Clean Water Act, right. Section 311. But um, so that that plan is under the Clean Water Act. If you're look, if you're starting to look into that affects water, right? right? So we're looking at spills of oil <laughs> into water, spills of oil onto land, spills of other hazardous mm -hmm. chemicals onto land. Um, you would be looking at, at your at a RCRA permit, and then you know things get really bad. Right. Looking at a circle cleanup. So don't think they're off the hook. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other questions before we move on? Okay. So moving on with the P's, um, we talked about penalties a little bit before, and Aaron mentioned them as far as the SPCC plans are concerned, but. The administrative penalties come from Section 309G of the Clean Water Act, and um, Class 1 and Class 2, uh, we're looking at the, the larger numbers just for purposes of the slide, 37,500 or 177,500. This is per day, per violation. So the penalties can really rack up against violators of the Clean Water Act, and this sometimes occurs um, over days or weeks or months and you are looking at a variety of, um, per of permit um, effluent limitations. So you could have one for mercury, you could have one for lead, just using common chemicals here. If you are violating both of those effluent limitations in your permit for a week, that's 37,500 per violation per both of those per day. So it quickly adds up. Um, uh, there's also civil penalties, same thing. Um, and I won't go into the, the details below that. And then this brings us to citizen suits. So um, a number of the environmental laws um, allow for citizens to bring lawsuits to enforce them. And these are known as citizen suit provisions. Uh, the Clean Water Act, thankfully, is one of them. Um, and that's why Riverkeeper is an organization. <laughs> um, under Clean Water Act, Section 505, a citizen must first serve a 60-day notice of intent to sue letter, and this goes to the company or violator, um, to the EPA and to the state permitting authority or the state. And this allows for the company to come into compliance and also allows for the agency to step in and um, diligently enforce the the Clean Water Act, um, possibly take an enforcement action, possibly come into some kind of um, memorandum of understanding to get back into compliance, um, impose penalties, that kind of thing. So the citizen suit is really a way of the citizens to say, hey, there's a violation occurring, and if you don't do something about it, federal or state government, we're going to take the lead on it. And so this... Um, the, if the agency convenes um, diligent prosecution, and that's a term of art under the Clean Water Act, then the citizen suit um, cannot stand, and it's then taken over by the agency. Um, we mentioned this a little bit before about standing when we were talking about um, the Storm King Mountain case, and it's critically important uh, element of bringing a citizen stu suit. Um, and under the Supreme Court um, case law, the potential plaintiff, the citizen, must show three things um, under the Clean Water Act. Injury in fact, which includes actual or imminent concrete and particularized inju injury. Um, a causal connection, it needs to be fairly traceable. Um, and the likelihood of injury, it can't be speculative and that injury needs to be able to be redressed by a favorable decision. Um, Environmental groups, um, groups of that nature, must also show organizational standing, um, which adds to the list of standing. So it's it's quite a big burden for for some groups to get over. How uh, do they, I mean, how do groups establish standing? What are some examples of right. how, what you might allege if you are an environmental group bringing a citizen suit? So um, most environmental groups, for the purpose of, um, well, not only for the purpose, but for the purpose of standing, have members. So you have to show that um, your mem any one of your members would have standing to bring the suit on their own. So your members would be injured um, in the way that we just talked about. Um, the interests of uh, the interests that you're seeking to protect as an organization must be germane to the organization's purpose. So, for example, River Riverkeeper is um, the defenders of the Hudson River. So we are interested in clean water. So 
a lawsuit that we bring must be germane to our purpose. And um, the, the relief sought and the claim being brought by the organization cannot require the participation of individual members. So I don't need my members to be able to bring the lawsuit, um, but I need them to establish standing. It's a little bit confusing, but um, it makes sense. And I don't know if that actually answered your question. No, Aaron. so you, you need them to exist and to yes. have um, the kinds of, they need to be, they're inter they join Riverkeeper because they're in, Correct. or NRDC or right. Sierra Club because they're interested in the protection of the environment. Right, they go hiking, they go kayaking, they enjoy, they enjoy the natural resources that we're trying to protect as an organization. Um, that's how you get standing as an organization. Um, so in addition to um, suing for enforcement or to stop pollution under a citizen suit, um, the Clean Water Act also allows citizens to force an agency to perform a non-discretionary duty. So we could sue an agency for failing to promulgate regulations, for example, or failing to issue a speedies permit when they need to. Um, and then finally, the most exciting thing under citizen suits is that it allows, under the Clean Water Act, for um, costs of litigation, which includes attorney's fees, fees for um, experts and, and things like in that nature. But um, the citizen must substantially prevail or prevail, and that's in the language of the Clean Water Act itself, to be entitled to this. And the reason that this is so exciting is because typically under American rule of law, um, everybody pays their own costs of litigation. Um, the English rule of law is uh, loser pays. So this is really a shift of what we commonly do in all sorts of litigation in, in the United States. And, and it's something that really allows um, the goal of the Clean Water Act to be met to, to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's water bodies, because it's not just left up to the states or the federal agencies that, you know, no offense to any agencies here, but could be overburdened in some respects. And so it really adds that extra level of oversight um, to protect our, our nation's water bodies. Yeah, we have, this, we have a question. Repeat, there were three elements before you got to the organizational Sure. Sure. So there's three elements to prove standing. Oh, I'm sorry. The question is can you just repeat the elements of standing? There are three elements. The first is injury in fact, and that is an actual or imminent concrete and particularized in uh, injury. The second element is a causal connection. And that causal connection must be fairly traceable. So your injury must be fairly traceable to what you're saying is causing it. Um, the third element is the likelihood of the injury. So the injury can't be speculative. Um, you can't say somebody might be upset if you tear down this mountain top. Um, and it, it must be able to be redressed by a favorable decision. So it has to be something real, basically, is, is the injury. Any other questions? Okay. Great. So Abby talked about suing for enforcement of uh, permit terms, violation of a permit, or discharging if a facility is discharging without a permit altogether in violation of the Clean Water Act. So let's talk for a moment about what's actually in these permits. And we can use the construct of four R's of NPDES permits, restrictions on discharge, reporting requirements, reopeners, and revocab revocability. So to start with the first are restrictions on discharges. NPDES permits will generally contain technology-based effluent limitations and water quality-based effluent limitations. So in the technology-based effluent limitations uh, are, are written because of requirements of the Clean Water Act that permits will maintain, will contain mandatory criteria um, and technology requirements depending on industrial category. So EPA writes effluent limitation guidelines for similar industries so that permit writers across the country have one place to go and to so that permits for, say, sand and gravel mining, uh, dischargers, seafood processing, uh, any kind of industry, most kinds of industries that you can think of, metal finishers, battery factories, leather producers, um, pulp and paper mills, these kinds of industries that exist across the country, 
there's one set of effluent limitations that permit writers can use as a resource and then calculate effluent limitations for that discharger, for that industrial discharger, um, based on the information that they receive from the applicant in their permit application, based on, you know, what is the production of this facility, what is the what is their flow rate of wastewater through their treatment system. And then the permit writer will find the appropriate effluent limitation guideline, combine that with the information in their application, and uh, do sophisticated calculations to come up with how much of any given pollutant a, a, a discharger can discharge uh, per day, per month, um, different averaging periods. And then that will be written in the permit and the permittee will then report on their compliance with that effluent limitation. Um, the Clean Water Act also calls for water quality based effluent limitations to protect water quality uses. We talked about those right in the beginning of this presentation. Water quality standards establish designated uses for a water body and aim to have waters be fishable, swimmable, and drinkable. Um, so then criteria are developed to protect uses of certain waters. Is this water going to be used to draw cooling water for industrial sources? Is there drinking water intake somewhere downriver um, where the water from that river is going to be taken up and treated for drinking water, but it should be of a certain water, a certain quality to begin with, um, so as to minimize the kind of energy, the amount of energy and resources that need to go into making it drinkable. Mm -hmm. um, is this use is this water used for wildlife propagation? Is it cold water fisheries or warm water fisheries? That matters a lot. Um, and then there's also uh, a policy that you will not degrade the quality of, of already high quality waters once you have them. So these three legs of water quality standards, uh, designated uses, criteria, and an anti-degradation policy are put together into a water quality standard under section 303 of the act. Um, and then the water quality standards are used by permit writers to make sure that the effluent limitations that they're writing for, say, their hypothetical pulp and paper mill or battery factory, uh, don't violate those water quality standards. So the Clean Water Act calls for any more stringent limitation to be put into permits. So the, per the um, permit writer will calculate technology-based effluent limitations if there's, if there's an appropriate uh, effluent limitation guideline for a, a category. He or she will also calculate water quality based effluent limitations and will put in the permit the one that is more uh, protective of water quality uses for the water that's going to be receiving the effluent from this, uh, this from the discharge, from the, mm -hmm. the discharger. And the permit writer will also consider whether or not there's a TMDL or total maximum daily load uh, for the water body into which the discharge will, will go. Um, if there is, then that's another consideration that the permit writer needs to make sure uh, that the, the point source for which they're writing a permit will not um, cause the, the water body to go over its diet, which is really what a TMDL is. It's a pollutant diet. It's determined that a, a water is impaired. We talked about impairments right at the beginning. It's not meeting its uses, um, what it should be, what folks should be able to use that water body for. Maybe there's too much phosphorus. Maybe there's too much nitrogen. Maybe there's too much trash, like the Anacostia River has a trash TMDL. Um, and there are innovative, pe people are coming up with innovative ways to remove trash from water. Um, I, learned, I heard on the radio just yesterday on NPR that Baltimore Harbor is in, in implementing this uh, new technology that physically removes trash from the, the runoff in, from Baltimore City streets. They're physically removing trash through this water wheel so that um, they don't contribute mm -hmm. to the amount of trash that's already in Baltimore Harbor that goes into Chesapeake Bay for which there is a TMDL. Um, so TMDL is calculated by, is developed by states, and it considers a waste load allocation, a consideration of all the point sources in the watershed that are contributing a pollutant to a water. It also calculates a load allocation, all the non-point sources in a water body, in a watershed that are contributing this pollutant of concern um, to the water body. And then there's um, like a margin of safety, basically. Um, so a permit writer for a point source needs to make sure that he or she is writing uh, an effluent limitation that doesn't make that point source uh, 
contribute any more than is already considered in the waste load allocation of that pollutant diet. You don't want to push that already impaired water body over its limit. And again, this is because we are not only maintaining, but restoring the water bodies to what they should be. So moving on, we have um, reporting requirements of one of the four R's. Um, so um, the um, permittee must report any non-compliance. Um, this is done through discharge monitoring reports. And I actually included a slide from what a discharge monitoring report looks like. Um, this is from, I believe, the dance camera facility. It's a power plant. Erin and I both uh, worked on cases against them <laughs> in the clinic at Pace Environmental Litigation Clinic. So, um, and uh, noncompliance is one of the reporting requirements. Um, and we talked about citizen suits. DMRs are publicly available documents that you can FOIL, um, Freedom of Information Law, or FOIA, Freedom of Information Act. Um, so citizen suits can be brought based on DMRs that organizations have received um, and can provide that basis for um, the citizen suit violation. And these are tracked to the kinds of effluent limitations that are written into your permit. So this is something that you, um, on a regular basis that's established in your permit, whether it's monthly or quarterly, you sub a facility mm -hmm. submits to their permitting authority so that the permitting authority can check what the limit is versus what the actual discharge is. Right, and the discharge monitoring reports report everything. They report when they're in compliance, when they're out of compliance. It's just, like Aaron mm -hmm. said, it's just, this is what we're doing. It's a, it's a monitoring report. Um, the permittee also has to report any known changes in discharges, um, any upsets or bypasses, um, if for some reason something shuts down and that, for example, uh, treatment facility needs to bypass untreated sewage um, that needs to be reported. Um, there's also a duty to provide information to um, the permitting authority and a right of entry so they can come on and inspect the facilities. Um, and there, there's a need for additional monitoring or special studies um, if for some reason there's a number of violations or just to double check to make sure that these DMRs are not being tampered with. Abby, what's an example of a additional monitoring or special study, say in some of the cases that you've worked on, if a power plant's out of compliance with their monitoring or with, with, out of compliance with their discharge, is there something they can do for the wildlife in a river? Sure. Um, I don't actually know if you're getting at something specific, so. I'm thinking of what we worked on with the, um, a requirement that might be in a permit to, for example, save fish <laughs> if, your, if your intake is in training or impinging fish. Right, so, um, I'd, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm not following your question. Oh, so <laughs> we, we worked on a case where um, it was a condition of a particular permit that, that was violating the Clean Water Act by entraining and impinging fish and larvae um, in their oh, intake structures. Yeah, so they had this particular facility, had a condition in the permit where they had to put um, special protective felt filters around right. their intake system. And mm -hmm. if they didn't do that, that was also a violation. So that's not a dis that's not a in and of, in of itself a discharge, right. a violation of a discharge requirement, but it was a special condition that was put into their permit. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> So um, another are, uh, are reopeners. So um, if there are changes in circumstances or additional new information comes to light, um, the permitting agency can look at the NIPDES or SPEEDES permit and reopen it basically. Go in and, and give it new effluent limitations, give it new um, special studies or restrictions. Um, this also occurs if there's a change in the discharge for some reason. They were discharging a lot of um, heat, but now for some reason they're discharging biocides in, F in ex exceedance, whereas that wasn't an issue before. Um, and also a change in the applicable toxic standards. So something that wasn't considered toxic before is now considered toxic. The permitting authority has the ability to go in and relook at that permit, um, see if that needs to be changed. And then, um, Finally, the last R that we're going to be talking about is the revocability of a permit. Um, as I mentioned, it's a license. It's not something you are guaranteed a, a right as a fact to do. So um, the permitting authority has the right to rescind that license. Um, 
and this can occur for violation permit, um, especially if there's continuing violations and the, the permittee is not doing anything to change that. It can also occur for the submission of false or misleading information, and that goes towards the criminal liability that we talked about. It's, it's not just, for some reason, we, we exceeded our limitation this month. It's, it's actually changing your DMRs, for example. Um, that kind of uh, falsification of records can lead to the revocability of a uh, speedies or nibbities permit. So now we want to talk about a few ways in which all of these factors that we've talked about, the elements of a Clean Water Act violation, um, the elements of a permit, uh, different technology standards, different designations of stormwater, uh, all come together in some recent Clean Water Act decisions. And then uh, we thought we'd also cover some climate change concerns of the, of the Clean Water Act and what might, moving forward, what might be some things that we all need to look out for and consider. So first, Abby will talk about the water transfers rule and cases. So one of the hot new things um, coming across the Clean Water Act desk is the EPA's Nibbity's Water Transfers Rule. Um, you can see here, this is a picture of the Esopus Creek in New York, and you can see the addition of um, this turbulent, muddied water into what would otherwise be a fairly pristine trout fish um, river. So that just gives you an idea of, of what we're talking about when we're talking about water transfers. So just a quick background, the final uh, EPA water transfers rule was published in 2008 and it followed the Supreme Court's 2004 decision in so South Florida Water Management District versus the Miccosukee Tribe of Indians. Um, and that Supreme Court case vacated a decision by the 11th Circuit which had held that Clean Water Act permit was required for the transferring of water from one navigable water to another. And the Supreme Court remanded the case for further fact-finding as to whether the two waters in question were, quote, meaningfully distinct. Uh, if they were not, a Nipotes permit would not be required. So if they were the same water body, basically, the Supreme Court held that there would not need to be a Nipotes permit under the water transfers rule. Because there would be no addition, assuming that that was true, there would be no addition of right. a pollutant into a water of the U.S. And so, um, given that holding, the Supreme Court declined to resolve the question of whether water transfers required Nipotes permits when the water bodies at issue were meaningfully distinct. So that was still out there. What if you have these two separate meaningfully distinct water bodies um, and you're transferring one water to the next. So um, so water transfers are, are typically defined as um, when you route one water through tunnels, channels, and or natural stream water features and either pump or passively direct it for uses such as providing public water supplies, irrigation, power generation, flood control, and environmental restoration. Um, as far as the Sobus Creek is concerned, uh, this has to deal with the New York City drinking wa water and the water set up there. Um, water transfers can be relatively simple or very complex um, moving over long distances. So the question here um, is whether or not a Nipotes permit is required for water transfers. And this arises because activities that result in the movement of waters such as trans basin water transfers um, uh, would would constitute that uh, meaningfully distinct um, this standard that the Supreme Court um, passed down. So as Aaron mentioned, the EPA's final rule concluded that water transfers would not need Nipotes permits because there is no addition um, under the Clean Water Act that took place when uh, waters that may or may not contain pollutants uh, were transferred from one place to another, even if that water was contaminated. And as we talked about, contamination and pollution include such things as, as mud and trash and refuse. So it's not just, you know, uh, toxically polluted waters. And so the EPA's rule defined water transfers as an activity that conveys or connects waters of the United States without subjecting the transferred waters to intervening industrial, municipal, or commercial uses. So you're taking water from one place and you're just moving it to another place, whether that 
constitutes through a stream or some kind of dam maybe and a reservoir and then you're discharging that water to the lower creek. Okay. Erin, do you have anything to add to the water no. transfer? Okay. So this brings us to the recent um, decision, the Catskill Mountains Chapter of Trout Unlimited, Inc. versus EPA, and States of New York, Connecticut, and Delaware versus EPA. These were two um, cases that were combined before the um, Southern District of New York. And this uh, rule uh, came out this year? Yes. And the appeals have been taken in this case, so just to let you know, and I think the response is due September 15th or thereabout, so this case is, is being appealed. So the plaintiffs in these two cases argued that Congress enacted the Clean Water Act, as, as we've gone over, to protect the water quality of receiving waters, and thus a transfer into a receiving water must be regulated by the NIPTES program, because we don't want to uh, endanger the integrity of the waters. And so uh, those plaintiffs argued that this Clean Water Act's plain and unambiguous language requires this NIPTES permit, um, but the judge rejected that clear and ambiguous language, saying that the appeals court in, a, in another decision did not clearly hold that um, the statute unambiguously forecloses EPA's interpretation. So what this really comes down to is um, it looks at the rule and determines whether or not EPA's definition and interpretation of the Clean Water Act was legitimate. So the issue here is whether the NIPTES permit is required for the transfer of waters in, of the United States. And for those non-legal people out there, I'm going to be talking about the Chevron analysis. So um, Chevron is a case that held that there's two steps in analyzing whether or not um, the uh, agency interpreted the, the statute correctly. In this case, step one, whether the Clean Water Act statutory language and or legislative history unambiguously resolves the question. The judge held that it did not. So it's not clear from the statute what, what um, Congress intended. So is EPA's um, interpretation legitimate? We have to look a little bit deeper into that. So then we look at step two, whether EPA's interpretation of the ambiguous language was permissible. So in this case, um, uh, the, the agency in making this interpretation can't act arbitrarily and must still consider relevant factors and provide a reasonable basis for its decision and its interpretation. In these cases, in the water transfer rule, rule cases, um, the judge held that EPA did not provide such a reasoned basis. Um, the, EP, the judge faulted EPA um, for failing to provide any reason for favoring the interests of water management agencies over the interests of preserving water quality. And the judge also found that EPA's resolution of a perceived statutory ambiguity was impermissible in this case because it created an irreconcilable conflict with the settled understanding of other terms of the Clean Water Act, um, particularly the Section 404 permitting requirements um, an understanding of what waters of the United States to, refer, to refer to water bodies, not physical water in pipes. So there was still some um, problems with the, whether or not the EPA's interpretation actually jived with what the Clean Water Act said. So um, the judge held that water in pipes cannot be navigable water under the statute. The ultimate holding of this case um, was that the water transfer rules was vacated to the consent extent it was inconsistent with the Clean Water Act, and it was remanded to the EPA for reconsideration and a, quote, reasoned explanation for its interpretation. So this is still out there. It's not settled case law in any respect, and um, I think the EPA is going to be looking at this over the next however long to, to see if they can come up with something that might pass legal muster if it's challenged again. Another issue that came up within the last Supreme Court term was the issue of forest roads and whether runoff from logging roads uh, is a point source discharge that should be permitted under NPDES. An uh, environmental group out in Oregon uh, thought that it should and sued. Um, and in this case, uh, Decker was the state forester of Oregon uh, and his predecessor in the lower courts uh, was also a named defendant. Um, and the, 
the question on appeal to the Supreme Court, the two questions on appeal to the Supreme Court were first whether the citizen suit provision uh, could be used to challenge the validity of an NPDES rule um, and not have judicial review of that rule. But people were also concerned about whether um, the Ninth Circuit erred in finding that the stormwater from logging roads is industrial stormwater that should be subject to Section 402 NPDES permitting, even though EPA has said it's not an industrial stormwater source. Remember, we talked about how some runoff is non-point source and not subject to NPDES permitting. Other runoff has been designated as industrial stormwater by EPA. Um, and is subject to industrial stormwater NPDES permitting. Um, runoff from logging roads had never been designated as such, and as industrial stormwater hadn't been subject to NPDES permitting, although um, the environmentalists argued that it carried, uh, that made streams more turbid, uh, which can affect wildlife and fish and their, especially salmonid species and their ability to navigate um, and feed. Um, but if it's non-point source discharge, then it can't. It's not regulated under 402. Some states regulate non-point source discharges in other ways, but it's not contemplated under 402. EPA didn't designate it as such. Um, Supreme Court held unanimously that logging roads are not industrial stormwater point sources, and um, so NPDES permits have never been required for logging road runoff. They're not required as of now. Um, EPA is considering designating a subset of stormwater discharges for, from forest roads under more flexible mechanisms, perhaps best management practices, um, non, other non-permitting approaches, but there's no timetable for that action. Uh, so that was the Supreme Court last term. There's al it seems like there's always some case coming mm -hmm. up. Um, and if you are in D.C. and you have the opportunity to go to any Supreme Court case, especially an environmental case, it's very interesting and very good educational experience. Um, I want to close out just by talking about climate change. Um, not any case in particular, but some th considerations to think about as conditions change around permitting. Here's a picture of a sewage treatment plant in Bay Park, Long Island, New York, uh, which flooded after Superstorm Sandy. It was one of hundreds of water utilities and treatment facilities that was flooded or compromised by the storm. And at this t because of that, billions of gallons of sewage and wa other wastewater entered New York Harbor, Long Island Sound, the and then the Atlantic Ocean. So what do we do? What happens when there are extreme weather events and there are large amounts of stormwater that f flood the streets um, and also overtake treatment facilities that are supposed to treat this water to, to protect human health and aquatic health. Uh, what do we do if water quantity changes and there isn't enough water to cool cooling towers right. or there um, is a there isn't enough flow to assimilate w some wastewater. What do we do when, when water warms and temperature changes impact uh, Clean Water Act permitting requirements? So EPA and states are looking at ways to improve the resiliency of water utilities so that when they're inundated by storm events, that doesn't translate into public health crises for cities and, and communities when there's all this stormwater and sewage suddenly in your streets um, or in your home or on your beach. Some potential approaches include green infrastructure innovations and investments um, so that the, the infrastructure itself, roads, highways, uh, green spaces mm -hmm. are more able to uh, absorb more water or, or block flooding. Right. Lots, of, lots of innovation and thinking going on there in EPA, if, at EPA and the states and in other NGOs and communities. Mm -hmm. um, so historical data, stream flow, precipitation amounts, temperature in waters um, might be outdated and it might not reflect current and future conditions. So EPA and states and um, think tanks, scientists may need to come up with new data tools to calculate new assumed lower flows. Um, and increased ambient water temperatures. We need to consider how this affects aquatic species and uses of waters. There could be ways to mitigate temperature changes, for example, by adding tree cover over streams. Um, also, the effect of some pollutants is magnified by increases in temperature. For example, higher water temperatures can lead to increased toxicity of certain pollutants like ammonia in aquatic species. Warmer water also has lower dissolved oxygen available for aquatic species. Um, so the 
we need to think about how extreme weather events are going to affect our wastewater infrastructure. Increased runoff can increase the rate of erosion and sedimentation, mm -hmm. requiring changes to stormwater controls and best management practices. Pollutant loadings associated with runoff are likely to increase more pathogens in our waters um, and easier spread of pathogens through different vectors. Um, and if certain facilities are now designed to be able to react and be resilient to certain storm sizes, what if that's the storm size looks like those are changing? Um, so what might be the construction requirements for such facilities? And there also could be changes in receiving water characteristics, uh, which NPDES permit writers have to consider when they're considering how much water, how much of a pollutant can a water body receive. Uh, the receiving water characteristics based on increases or decreases in runoff could affect the beneficial uses of waters. Are we always going to be able to swim and fish in waters that are, that are receiving more pathogens or more pollutants? Also, freshwater intrusion into marine environments is, and estuaries and bays um, is going to be a problem. And so as we consider flow, temperature, kinds of pollutants that are being exacerbated by climate change, um, I think it will be an, an interesting thing to see how states, federal government, and uh, NGOs react to these changes. So um, that pretty much concludes our formal presentation. Um, I think we'll probably turn to the fact pattern and see if there's anything else in here that we might want to take a look at as far as the Clean Water Act is concerned. And um, I just want to say, because no Clean Water Act presentation would be complete without it, that dilution is not the solution <laughs> to pollution. So just needed to throw that out there. <laughs> and we can also take any questions if you guys yeah. have any on what we've covered. So any about the fact pattern, anything that you saw in the fact pattern that we didn't touch on here that you are curious about? Well, I'll start. <laughs> oh, about the fact pattern? <laughs> yeah. Okay, go ahead. There's just one thing. Um, in the second to last paragraph here, uh, the last sentence talks about how, according to the DEP, the spill did not appear to harm any aquatic life in the Elk River or its tributaries, and no fish kills were reported in the infected area. And I'm just, you know, raising the point, is, is such a level of fish kills or harm to aquatic organisms necessary for a violation of the Clean Water Act? No, it's not. You guys are right. It's not. Um, we are solely looking at what is coming out of the pipe, if anything, and whether or not that's adding something to a, to a water body. Um, anything else from the fact pattern or any other general questions? Okay, question. Well, Sure, and I can talk to you further about that afterwards. Yeah. But um, so Riverkeeper, I mentioned defenders of the Hudson River. We protect the. Oh, sorry. She just um, the question was just a little bit more about um, what I do and what Riverkeeper does. Um, so Riverkeeper is a not-for-profit environmental member supported organization defending the Hudson River um, and the New York City drinking watershed. Um, we we started off as um, the Hudson River Fishermen's Association, and then. Uh, morphed into Riverkeeper in the late 80s or early 80s. Um, we were founded by um, um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and John Cronin. Um, and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is still very active with Riverkeeper and also the, the larger Waterkeeper Alliance. So um, Riverkeeper, Waterkeeper, we, we um, typically try to protect the, um, the water bodies that we're interested in through bringing uh, citizen suits or otherwise intervening in, um, for example, part of the Nipodes program is allowing public comment on the proposed permits by the agencies. And so groups like Riverkeeper and other citizens can, can comment on those and then actually intervene um, in, some, in some adjudicatory hearings regarding those permits. Um, so those are kinds of the things that we and other citizen groups do. Any other questions? So this last picture that I put up here um, where we ask for questions is one of my favorite bodies of water. It's from um, my hometown in New Hartford, Connecticut. This is the Bark Hampstead Reservoir in Connecticut. And I like to show it because it is very beautiful. And so it 
um, also represents a lot of reasons why we want to protect clean water. It's an aesthetic, aesthetically enjoyable place to go. Um, it is available for recreation, so re protected for recreational uses, fishing, swimming. Um, to the, there are different recreational uses that waters can meet, whether you're going to fully immerse yourself in a water or whether you're going to just maybe get splashed if you're in a boat. Um, but the reason that this reservoir is so clean is that it's also a municipal drinking water source that supplies drinking water uh, for the greater Hartford area. Um, and and so it's um, one of the reasons that I wanted to become involved in protection of clean water because places like this exist in our hometowns and they sh or um, or should exist for people to enjoy and derive satisfaction, health benefits, and, and other benefits from. So uh, Abby and I are happy to stay around and, and answer your questions personally. We want to thank you for coming and spending your afternoon with us. We hope you'll come to other Environmental Law Institute events. The great ones, the summer school is great, it's free, um, and it'll add a lot to your understanding of the entire body of environmental law. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you.